President, Professor Freund, uh, Vice Presidents, uh, General Assembly of the respected Hungarian Academy of Sciences. As you just heard, I, I was born in Hungary, but I left uh, when I was a child, so I won't be able to speak in Hungarian. I can understand it, but not to give a lecture. Uh, so I'll give it in, in English. I hope it's all right. Um, and uh, I would like to, again to express my gratitude for, for inviting me uh, to this wonderful place. So let me tell you about my work. Uh, I am working for quite a long time now on the problem of how proteins are degraded in cells. And for that, first, I have to explain what are proteins, because there is a very uh, mixed uh, audience. So let me start. So proteins are the so-called machines of our body. Almost all the processes that we need for life are carried out by proteins. For example, proteins carry out the different chemical processes. Oh, sorry. It was the chemical processes. We have thousands of different chemical reactions in our body which are all required for our life. And all these uh, thousands of different chemical reactions are carried out by thousands of different proteins which are called the enzymes. So we, we need uh, many, many enzymes because each, each enzyme carries out a, a certain uh, chemical reaction. Then uh, we need uh, proteins for physical processes. Uh, for example, uh, the working of our brain. There, there are all kinds of electric activities, physical activities, which are, again, carried out by proteins. The working of our muscles, it's uh, the contraction of our muscles. Uh, that's a physical uh, activity carried out by proteins. Then proteins are also regulators. They regulate the different uh, things that go uh, in our uh, cells and in our, in our bodies, like uh, the division of our cells, like the development of the embryo, how an embryo it develops from one cell, the fertilized egg, to be a whole, uh, whole organism. Of course, the proteins are also involved in the immune response. You heard about antibodies. We have thousands of different antibodies. Each antibody is uh, neutralizing a certain invading uh, organism, and we can have we, we, we can do that because each antibody is a different protein that carries out this, its function and uh, the neutralization of that invader. So we have many many thousands of different proteins in our cells, and each of them has a specific function. Now, how can we have so many proteins? Here we have to know how proteins are made. Uh, proteins are made of building blocks uh, called the amino acids. The name is not important. The importance is to, to know that we have building blocks. Oops. Uh, building blocks, and there are 20 of these building blocks, and they're combined with each other in the protein like beads on a string, and the lengths of a string can be several hundred or more uh, amino acids that are tied together in that string uh, of the protein. Now, the difference between the different proteins is the order in which these, the same 20 amino acids are arranged, order or sequence. So as you can imagine, uh, the same 20 uh, uh, building blocks, if they are arranged in different orders, we can have thousands or many millions even of different sequences uh, within a couple of hundreds of amino acids that are joined together. So that's how we can have so many uh, proteins. Now, uh, by having the, the same building blocks arranged in different sequences. But how, how do we know what sequence will be each protein? That, that information is provided by, by our genes, by the DNA. So DNA is the blueprint. It is the blueprint for the, the, to, to determine what will be the sequence of the gene, which is the, the certain protein uh, that is made, and in, in what order will the, the 20 amino acids uh, be uh, um, uh, joined together. And once the protein is made by the information carried out uh, by, by the DNA, it, it falls, oh, sorry, like, how do I get back, please? Oh, here. 
So once the, the protein uh, is made, it falls to a certain shape. Each shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids in this protein, and the shape determines the sequence or the function uh, of the protein. So that whole process that I said of combining amino acids uh, to proteins based on the, on the information in the DNA is called protein uh, synthesis. And when I started to work in science, there, there was, it was just discovered how proteins are synthesized, how DNA gives the information, how it is regulated, how is a certain protein is turning on, turning off. So there was a huge interest in protein synthesis and in the regulation of protein synthesis. At the same time, it was known that proteins are not only synthesized, but they are also degraded. They are disassembled back uh, to amino acids. But there was not much interest in that, so uh, it looked very wasteful. Why, why, would, uh, it, uh, why, why should a, a protein be degraded uh, after it's made? It looked, looked very wasteful, and there was not much interest in it. Actually, whoever was interested uh, knew that there are some important functions of protein degradation. And here are the two main functions. Uh, the, uh, some uh, proteins uh, lose their, the, their shape, their folding. Uh, very, very, uh, it's very delicate. It can be lost very easily by, by all kinds of damages. And when the, the, the shape of the protein is lost, it becomes abnormal. And then uh, the abnormal protein is not only not active, but also is to toxic. It can, uh, it can kill the cells in which it, it, uh, it, it is uh, accumulating. So it's very important to recognize abnormal proteins and to remove them by protein degradation. So that's one important role of protein degradation. But there is another important role, which, is, which acts on completely normal proteins. Uh, and that is to degrade regulatory proteins. So some proteins that regulate a certain process have to act for a very short, uh, defined period of time, and then they have to be removed. Imagine, for example, uh, the, an orchestra. We can, uh, we can imagine the cell like a huge orchestra in which the thousands of proteins are the players, and they play in harmony, and then we have a symphony. Now, one of the players now gets up, let's say a trumpet, plays a tune, but then he has to stop. If he doesn't stop, he will ruin the symphony. So it's very important to stop. In the cell, it stops by degrading. It, may, it, it starts by making the protein, by synthesis. It stops by degrading the protein. So the trumpeter is being destroyed. So it's a quite uh, drastic way to, to stop uh, an action, but that's a very efficient way, and that's how, how things are regulated in cells. So when I was, uh, uh, as I said, a, a young postdoctoral fellow, uh, I, uh, by accident I heard about protein degradation, uh, and uh, I thought that even though it's, it's not much in, uh, inter in, in general interest, it's, it's in, I thought it's an important process. And I also I began to work on it, and I, by accidentally I found that the degradation of proteins inside the cells requires energy. And that, was, that impressed me very much because protein degradation outside the cell, like uh, digestion, does not de require energy. So why is energy required for protein degradation? And because of these reasons, I began to work on the problem of protein degradation and ask the questions, uh, how are cellular proteins degraded in a highly selective and regulated uh, mode? So how is one protein out of the many thousands of proteins is degraded at a certain time and the others are not degraded? How is this selected? It's called the selectivity. What determines this high selectivity of protein degradation? And then the second question was, why is energy required for the degradation of proteins, which, which I just discovered? And then I kind of combined that. I thought maybe energy is, is needed for selectivity. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I didn't turn off my cell phone. Okay. Uh, so why is energy needed for selectivity? And that, uh, that, um, that thermodynamically it made sense because we need 
uh, energy to, rec to, to produce order. That is a, a thermodynamic pr principle. But how is that made? So uh, I, I saw that these are very important questions, and then I began to work on the problem of how proteins are de uh, degraded in cells and why is energy needed uh, for selectivity. And I began to work on it after I re returned from my postdoctoral fellowship uh, from uh, San Francisco to Israel to Haifa, assembled uh, uh, a group of, of students who, who worked with me, uh, a research assistant, and began to work on how proteins are degraded in cells. And I thought uh, that the best way is to use a biochemical approach. In biochemistry, if you want to know how a complex system works, one has to open the cell to isolate the different components of the system, to, to uh, characterize them how they work, and then to put them back together. And if it works again, uh, you will know how the system works. Uh, I can liken it to, to a watch. We, if we want to know a, a mechanical watch, how mechanical watch works, we have to open up the watch, of course, very carefully. No, didn't turn it off. I, I thought I did. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. So we have to open up the watch. We have to take out the different wheels and springs to find out how they look. And if we can put back uh, the, 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 wings, uh, the, the wheels and the springs and the watch works again, then we understand how the watch works. That is the biochemical approach of uh, uh, taking a, a part of a complex system and putting it back together. And that's what we wanted to know. And it took up a couple of years. And uh, we first isolated one, one component uh, of the system, which is a small protein you called ubiquitin. It, it was called ubiquitin because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's in all, uh, all cells in our body. But it was known, the, the presence of that protein was known before I began to work on it, but the function was not known. It was not known what is ubiquitin doing. And we isolated this small protein and, isolated and identified it as ubiquitin, and we knew it is part of the system that degrades proteins in dependence of energy. So that was the first step. It was like isolating a, a wheel of, the, of that, uh, uh, of that uh, uh, watch, so we knew the wheel is, the, is part of the machinery, but we didn't know how it works. But it was an important step forward because it allowed us to find out how the system works. So this is the structure of ubiquitin here. It's a small protein, uh, only 76 amino acids. We don't, you don't see the amino acids, you see only the general shape. So, uh, you see only uh, the general shape, it is very compact, but it has uh, one end that is flexible, and that's an important end because here, with, with that end, it gets uh, bound chemically to the proteins that have to be degraded. So we found uh, two years later that ubiquitin by, actually is bound by a strong chemical linkage to the protein that has to be degraded, and that is, it, it actually is marking. It is a marking mechanism, the, the binding of ubiquitin to the protein that has to be degraded, uh, that targets it for degradation. So that was the main uh, finding, and uh, the following 10 years, we worked on the, uh, on the details of this uh, system, uh, of the, that is how, how the whole watch works, and I won't, won't go into all the details, it's too technical, but uh, basically we found that the ubiquity-mediated protein degradation system is, is made of two parts. In the first part, the ubiquitin chain, the uh, ubiquitin is linked to the protein, so um, again, Ubiquitin is linked to the protein, that is the first part. Um, and then uh, in the second part, the protein that is linked to ubiquitin is degraded by a big machinery called the proteasome. So in the first part, I won't go into all the details, but you, uh, you can see the protein that is this uh, brownish thing, uh, to which ubiquitin, there's the small, uh, uh, um, uh, um, the small uh, 
um, uh, blue uh, uh, circles is, uh, uh, is added, and then a chain is made in which each ubiquitin is bound to the previous ubiquitin. I don't want to go into the details, just wanted to point out two things. One, that a, a molecule called ATP is required for this process. ATP is the molecule that contains the energy in cells. So the, the binding uh, of, of ubiquitin to the protein we found requires ATP, requires energy. And that is the answer to our first question. Why is energy needed for protein degradation? Energy is actually needed for the linking of ubiquitin for, for what, is, what happens before the actual protein degradation, for the marking. Because, and that now makes make sense, because to mark, you may, must made, make a chemical bond. To make a chemical bond requires the investment of energy. So we have we invested energy in order to have uh, um, this marking process. And the second uh, thing that I wanted to point out, that the third enzyme, there are three enzymes that are involved, and the, the third is one is the most important, enzyme number three, E3, because the third enzyme is the enzyme that recognizes to which protein a ubiquitin has to be linked. And now we know there are about 600 different E3 enzymes, and each E3 enzyme links ubiquitin to a different kind of a protein, but that it recognizes a certain structure in the protein. And that gives us the, uh, the, the answer to the second question of what determines the high selectivity of protein degradation. Uh, the high selectivity is determined by the, by the selectivity of the E3 enzymes that uh, ligate ubiquitin uh, to different proteins. And then, as I said, in the second part of the system, the protein that is now linked to ubiquitin is degraded by a structure called the proteasome. The proteasome is like a barrel into which the protein that has been linked to ubiquitin is stuffed inside. It's like a meat grinder, but a very sophisticated meat grinder because only proteins that are linked uh, uh, to ubiquitin are, are being put inside that machine and are, are chopped up uh, to small pieces. So that is what determines that only proteins that are linked to ubiquitin are degraded because the proteasome will degrade only proteins that are linked uh, to ubiquitin. So by that process, the protein is now chopped up to, to, to small pieces and then from them to amino acids. And ubiquitin actually escapes the machinery intact and it can be used again uh, for, uh, for, binding, for uh, binding to another protein and targeting it for degradation. So that was the basic biochemistry of the ubiquitin system that, that we found out, we, I mean, uh, my, my, my students, myself, my collaborators, and that first only we were interested in, but uh, gradually other people g g got, got interested. And I also began to work on the problem of what is this system doing in the cells? Because until now we used model, model uh, proteins and we just uh, used one certain uh, cell in which we, we investigated the problem. So that is how I got interested in the roles of the ubiquitin system in cell division. And uh, that is a, a diagram from a textbook of how the cell divides. It's called the cell division cycle. You can, uh, you can write it in a way of a cycle. It is, it is a, a process in which the cell divides. It first it grows, it begins, begins better, it duplicates its contents, it duplicates its DNA, it has a double number of DNA, and then uh, after it does all that, uh, there is a, a, a phase called uh, mitosis. Uh, in mitosis, the, the DNA that has been duplicated and packaged into chromosomes, now dividing, the chromosomes separate, and we have two new cells. And then we, if you have another cycle, the two cells be, uh, uh, turn to four cells and so on. So that was known for more than 100 years, that cells are dividing this way. But it's not known what makes them to divide. And only um, uh, recently it was found out that it is, it is done by certain cell cycle regulatory proteins uh, called cyclins. And cyclins are proteins that are raised, that levels of which raise and then decline at certain phases of cell cycle. There are several cyclins 
several cyclins for each the phase of the cell cycle. And to get into the cell, into that phase, the cyclin has to be made, it's synthesized. But to get out of that stage, cyclin has to be degraded. Otherwise, it cannot, cannot finish the, 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 the first stage. So here, cyclin, the levels of cyc this cyclin go down. Here, the levels of the other cyclin go down. And all that degradation of cyclins is carried out by the ubiquitin system. So I got interested in that problem and asked, what degrades cyclin? And I found out the ubiquitin ligases, as I said, uh, the E3 enzymes are the most important, and while they are degrading uh, uh, ubiquitin or uh, cyclins only at certain five times of the cell cycle, and what really uh, controls cell cycle. And that's important. Cell cycle regulation is an important problem in biomedicine because uh, uh, Cancer is due to the loss of control of cells, uh, cell division. The cells divide when they should not divide. So uh, there is a lot to do uh, in the problem of how the ubiquitin system controls cell division. So as I said at the beginning, we were only uh, the only laboratory who was interested in ubiquitin-mediated protein degradation. But afterwards, many other uh, laboratories got interested, in, and it turned out that ubiquitin-mediated protein degradation is important in almost all basic cell physiology, or all, all the, more, almost all the processes that we need for to life or for the life of the cell. Ubiquitin-mediated protein degradation is involved, such as the control of cell division. Uh, I just mentioned that. Then we have what is called signal transduction, the signals from outside the cell, let us say, sensing what is, the, what, what, what is in, in, in the proximity of the cell, what, what is the nutrients and, and all that, uh, signals have to get from the outside to the inside and the ubiquitin system is involved in that. It is involved in the regulation of the expression of genes, so genes are expressed as proteins only at when, when it is needed, and the ubiquitin system is involved with that, especially in genes that have to be uh, in, in, that have to be expressed during inflammation, immunity. Uh, it is involved in the development of the embryo, in what is called apoptosis or programmed cell death. Sometimes a cell has to die for uh, for the organism to to remain to remain healthy. And that is also the ubiquitin system is involved. And of course, in, in all these, these are the, the degradations of regulatory proteins. As I mentioned in the case of cycling, many other regulatory proteins have to be degraded at a certain times for the normal physiology of the cell cycle. And of course, protein quality control is also uh, remains, uh, the, uh, the removal of abnormal proteins remains, uh, remains an important function of ubiquitin-mediated protein degradation. Um, and also, people who were, uh, who were interested in diseases found that the abnormalities in the ubiquitin system underline many uh, uh, diseases, such as many types of cancer are due to changes that, are, that involve the roles of the ubiquitin system in the control of cell division, and I'll talk a little more about that. There are some major neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, in which, which are caused, at least to, to a great extent, by the accumulation of abnormal proteins in certain cells uh, in the brain. So as I said, abnormal proteins you normally are very uh, quickly removed, but in some, uh, some instances they are not removed, they slowly accumulate, and when they accumulate, they, they destroy the cells, and that, that, was, that is uh, the, the reason um, uh, for many cases of uh, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. The ubiquitin system is involved in certain kinds of mental retardation uh, in which there are some genetic changes in, uh, in uh, proteins involved in mental function. In muscle wasting, there is an increased degradation of muscle proteins, what is called cachexia, it's terminal cancer, or in many uh, terminal diseases, uh, it's, it's, it's a it's a serious complication, and so on. So the, uh, it, these are only selected, uh, uh, selected uh, examples, and the ubiquitin system is heavily involved uh, in human uh, disease. Now, uh, how cancer uh, 
uh, is may, how cancer is produced by abnormalities of the ubiquitin system. Um, normal cell division is due to a balance of, of proteins that stimulate cell division called oncoproteins and proteins that inhibit cell division. Okay. And proteins that inhibit cell division are called uh, tumor uh, suppressor proteins. Uh, normally there is a, a balance between the action of uh, oncoproteins and the tumor suppressor proteins, so the cell divides only when it should divide. It, it doesn't divide when it should not divide. But in cancer there is an imbalance. Uh, either the oncoproteins go up too much and there is a lot of stimulation of cell division, or uh, the tumor suppressor go proteins go down. It's like, like a car. So to operate a car, you need a gas pedal, which will push the car forward, and a brake pedal that will restrain the, 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 the car. And you, you usually, you, don't, uh, you only drive when you should drive, and you stop when you should stop. Now, when you push the gas pedal all the time, uh, the car gets out of control. Or when you lose the brake, uh, uh, the car gets out of control. And many times it's both. It's both uh, pushing the gas pedal and losing the brake. And of course, the, the cell that is uh, pushing the, the, the gas is oncoproteins go up. Losing uh, the brake is tumor suppressor go, um, proteins go down. And it happens at the same time. And get that con uh, causes the uncontrolled rapid uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, proliferation and division of, of uh, tumor cells. Now, how is the ubiquitin system involved? That's because both the oncoproteins and the tumor suppressor proteins are in a rapid turnover. That is, they are made all the time, they are degraded all the time. And now, when there is a lack of degradation of oncoproteins, the oncoprotein is made and it is not degraded, so its level goes up. So that, that happens in many human cancer. Or tumor suppressor proteins go up and they, they, they degrade the tumor suppressor proteins. Also happens in many, many uh, human cancers. So cancer can be caused by the lack of degradation of oncoproteins or by the too rapid degradation of tumor suppressor proteins. So that's, that's, these are important facts uh, regarding cancer biology. And because of that, the drug companies began to get interested in the ubiquitin system, in our basic research on the ubiquitin system, and began to develop uh, drugs uh, tar targeted against uh, the ubiquitin system. And the drug that is already in use uh, for several years is Velcade or Bortezomib proteasome inhibitor. There are also other proteasome inhibitors. And they are very efficient for the treatment of multiple myeloma, a, a bone marrow cancer. So that is a cancer in which cells that usually make the antibodies begin to be, to be cancerous, they, and they are dividing, and they uh, destroy the bone marrow, and that is a very bad disease, where the people died within a short time. With the, uh, such uh, uh, um, new uh, drugs, uh, targeted drugs like the Velcade, which is targeted against uh, the proteasome of these cells. These cells uh, go into apoptosis, they die, and the patients can have many, many years of uh, good quality life. So it is, it is a, a, a drug that, that really gave, gave a lot of uh, quality of life uh, to these patients. So um, for me personally, because my background is from medicine, it was very, uh, uh, very satisfying to know that our work of many uh, years, eventually it was turned into a drug that helps many, many thousands of sick people uh, all around the world. Uh, and I would like to, to, to tell you that uh, this work is not by, done by one person. It is a team of persons, and, and I was helped. And uh, I would like to thank uh, for many people who helped me for many years. Uh, in my lab at the Technion, I was helped by these people, including uh, my wife, who is here, Judy Hershko, who worked, who helped me many years, for many years, not only at home, but also at work. Uh, and parts of the work uh, were done by uh, graduate students, uh, such as Aaron Chachanover, who was my PhD student uh, during the discovery of the ubiquitin system. And for that, he shared the Nobel Prize with me. 
and I was also glad to share the Nobel Prize with Erwin Rose, who was my host for sabbaticals at the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Thank you very much for your attention.